when you started really focusing on a biological father and a biological mother raising kids, why the biological pair of a mother and a father are the optimal way to raise children? Well, when I first started writing, I didn't know that biology was such a big deal. I just knew that moms and dads were a big deal because I had been around a lot of kids who had lost their mom or dad. And it resulted in a lifelong wound. Um, But then the more that I researched about the importance of marriage and family, and the more that I looked at the dramatic um, devastation leveled on children who experience family breakdown, even if they were raised in a step family household, even if they were grafted into an adoptive family, um, it, it was very obvious through the decades of social science research that we have on family structure, that biology confers several things on children that simply intending to parent can't. Number one, it statistically grants children with the adults who are the most connected to, invested in, and protective of them, either because of our sin nature or because of evolutionary forces. Unrelated adults simply don't make the same level of connection investment and don't care for and watch over children the same way they do their own biological offspring. So what you see is in any household context where children lose a relationship with one or both biological parents, and especially if an unrelated adult joins the home, rates of abuse and neglect skyrocket. So there's, it's undeniable that biology confers a level of just safety and investedness that wanting kids or just being interested in the child's biological parent doesn't grant them. The other reason why biology matters so greatly is because only a child's biological parents grant something that they crave, and that is their biological identity. You know, I used to be the former assistant at the largest Chinese adoption agency in the world. Um, I was in the adoption world before I became a mom. Now I've got three biological kids and I have one adopted child. Um, he is ours. I mean, he is a Faust forever. Uh, but there are some things that I can't fully compensate for that he's lost. There's answers that I can't give him. You know, there's there's insights into his identity that he can't discover by looking at his dad and me. And those kinds of things tend to matter to adopted children. Um, they certainly matter when we survey children who were intentionally severed from their biological mother and father at the moment of conception through reproductive technologies. So biology is a major force in child well-being, both in terms of like safety, love, connection, and investment, but also in terms of helping kids answer the question, who am I? Because it's very, very hard for kids to answer the question, who am I? If they can't answer the question, whose am I? Genealogical bewilderment. Is that it? That is exactly the clinical term that has been observed in adoptees for decades. So tell us a little bit more about what that is. Less about science. What does that look like for the kids that are affected by it? Yeah, it's interesting because... They first started to notice it among um, adoptees who were placed with their parents during what was known as the baby scoop era. This is like the 50s, 60s, and 70s when out-of-wedlock births were still quite stigmatized, and they would take white babies, white infants, and place them with white parents. And sometimes these children didn't even know they were adopted um, because they were the parents were told, it doesn't matter, don't tell them. You know, it's better off if they never knew even sometimes. And yet these kids had this sense of otherness. You know, they would describe it as feeling like alien, separated, like disconnected, disassociated from their own bodies. Um, Like there was something wrong. They had a sense that they didn't belong somehow. Um, And then there's one story that we have of a woman um, on our website, thenbeforeus.com. One of the things we have is a story bank of kids who have lost a relationship with their mother or father talking about how that impacted their childhood and then even into their adulthood, their parenthood, you know, their life long term. And she talked about how when she discovered that her father who raised her was not her biological father because she was created through sperm donation. And she talks about how she couldn't look at herself in the mirror because suddenly she realized that she couldn't place half of her features, that she felt like an alien looking back at herself, that she felt like she was a stranger in her own body um, and that it plunged her into an identity crisis. It was a bewilderment about her own genealogy, her own genes didn't make sense to her. So that's not actually an uncommon experience. We've got especially adoptees talking about that feeling of 
otherness. Like they just don't fit in the family. And now we've got this new generation of children who were intentionally separated from a mother or father through reproductive technologies. Also talking about how not only do they feel that genealogical bewilderment, but add on top of that, the fact that they were created through commercial processes where they were often literally selected from a catalog, a donor, a sperm donor, or egg donor catalog, where you could sift and sort and select different attributes, um, different features of the child. So they not only have that genealogical bewilderment, but they also have this feeling of commodification that goes along with it. So this separation of children from their biological parents is, um, is no small deal for them. And then once you commercialize it and industrialize it, we're just heaping additional burdens on children's shoulders.